This is part three of a mini-series on loneliness and belonging. In part one, I talked about loneliness, how disturbingly common it is, and how it can wreak havoc in our lives. God created us for relationships. It is not good for people to be alone, lonely. In part two, I went over self-determination theory, which argues that our behaviors and decisions are driven by three basic needs, competence, relatedness, and autonomy. So this desire to not be lonely could be framed as a hunger to experience competence, relatedness, and autonomy in community. Or, to say it another way, I will never really feel like I belong if competence, relatedness, and autonomy isn't part of my communal experience. I will still feel lonely. The million-dollar question, then, is how do we move from loneliness to that true sense of belonging? There's only one way. We have to learn how to make and maintain friendships. But as many of us have discovered, that's sometimes easier said than done, especially for adults. In childhood, we are surrounded by potential playmates at school and on the playground, and friendships just seem to happen. And in adolescence, changes in the brain's reward center drive us toward what scientists call a social reorientation, where teens begin to shift away from time with parents and toward time with friends. Friendships during our teen and college years can also feel more intense because of what scientists call theory of mind, which is our growing ability to understand others' emotions, thoughts, motivations, and points of view. But for many adults, social reorientation and theory of mind are well established, and now making new friends and maintaining old friendships is a lot more difficult. Besides being set in our ways, we're all busy with work, family, and other grown-up responsibilities, and friendships often end up taking a back seat to everything else. And then there's the reality that many of our connections just aren't very fulfilling. Author and speaker Shasta Nelson asked more than 6,000 people, how close and fulfilling are your friendships on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the closest, most satisfying? Between 50 and 70% scored their friendships a 5 or below. Why is that? Why aren't our relationships more satisfying? And why don't we prioritize friendships more? Furthermore, if we want to make new friends, what's the best way to go about it? Dr. Marissa Franco, psychologist and friendship expert, believes there's at least two ingredients that need to be at play for friendship to happen organically. Number one, hanging out or what she calls continuous, unplanned interaction. And number two, getting real, which she calls shared vulnerability. As adults, we don't get a lot of opportunities for either continuous, unplanned interactions or shared vulnerability. Franco points out that work often gives us that continuous, unplanned interaction, but those relationships are often so formal and professional that there's little shared vulnerability. Shasta Nelson, who I mentioned earlier, says that when you look at all the research, including Dr. Franco's, three common denominators emerge. She calls these positivity, consistency, and vulnerability. Nelson believes all relationships start with what she called positivity. Now, for me, the word positivity is a little confusing because what she describes isn't what typically comes to mind when I hear that word. So to explain it, let me pull in some of the research that I shared on previous episodes of this podcast. Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett, who is among the top 1% most cited scientists in the world for her revolutionary research on emotions, describes a model that I think is helpful. Now, if you haven't yet listened to episode 53, The Brain Process That Can Build or Destroy Resilience, I highly recommend you hit that next because it's going to give you a much clearer explanation than I'm about to give you. In a nutshell, the concepts stored in our brains combined with sensory input allows us to make predictions. Those predictions drain what Barrett calls our body budget, 
which then stimulates a rudimentary version of feelings, which psychologists call affect. Now, affect can be positive, meaning primarily pleasant and calm, or negative, primarily unpleasant and agitated. When Nelson says positivity, I think what she's really describing is affect. She does also use words like acceptance, support, and validation, but those are all mental concepts. So, to put them together, my interactions with others gets combined with my concepts of acceptance, support, and validation, and leads to a rudimentary affect that is either positive, primarily pleasant and calm, or negative, primarily unpleasant and agitated. And Nelson also calls this satisfying, which just makes sense. Anything that is primarily pleasant and calm will also be satisfying. So friendships begin with interactions that produce a predominantly positive affect. In fact, research says that every relationship to stay healthy needs to have a ratio of five positive affect interactions for every one negative affect interaction. Nelson's second common denominator is consistency, which is essentially the same as Franco's continuous unplanned interaction. Nelson calls it the hours logged, the history we build, the time we spend together making rituals and creating patterns. Now, because we're creatures of habit, which I covered in episode 70 using the disc to better understand yourself and others, consistent time together, especially in continuous unplanned interactions, creates that sense of predictability and allows us to feel safe around one another. And Nelson's third common denominator is vulnerability, which Franco points out is shared. Now, this word gets thrown around a lot in psych and self-help circles, and it feels a little fluffy. So let me give you my geeky, nerdy guy definition of vulnerability. In the movie The Hobbit, Bilbo Baggins has his first interaction with the terrifying beast that he addresses as, quote, O oh, smog the unaccessibly wealthy, O oh, smog the stupendous, end quote. His flattery is well deserved because smog is, well, practically indestructible. I say practically because he does have one small vulnerability, a missing armored scale that exposes that soft flesh over his heart. Now, King Solomon said in Proverbs 4.23, quote, Above all else, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life, end quote. It's generally understood that we are to guard our hearts against evil, but we often guard them against common relational risk as well. Aside from those who wear their hearts on their sleeves, so to speak, most of us take steps to protect our hearts and keep them out of the prying eyes of others who might use any vulnerability to do us harm. This is even more true these days in a social media-saturated world where trolls take aims at any perceived vulnerability just for sport and self-amusement. But true, intimate friendship can't exist without some level of vulnerability. Or, in my geeky analogy, without risking exposing at least some part of our hearts that is normally well-armored. So the answer to the question of how can we know so many people and yet still feel so lonely sometimes, it's because our friendships don't allow for those three common denominators. But when our friendships do allow for positive affect, consistent unplanned interactions, and some level of shared vulnerability, it makes a true sense of community and belonging possible. How so? I think an analogy might explain it better. I'm a hot tea drinker. But Lots of people drink hot tea, even in America. That said, some of the people I know think of me as a bit of a quote-unquote tea snob because I'm pretty picky about my tea habit. I don't even want a cup of tea if it isn't brewed at the right temperature. Black tea and black tea blends I brew at 210. Green tea and green tea blends at 175 to 180. Oolong at 190, etc. But to accomplish this task, I have a Bonavita programmable kettle. So, as an analogy, my empty teacup represents loneliness. My properly brewed cup of tea represents belonging. To get from loneliness, that empty cup, to belonging, the proper cup, 
requires two things. One, I have to plug my kettle in, that is, connect its three-pronged cord into the power source. And number two, I have to program or punch in the right three-digit temperature for my chosen tea. Loneliness, friendships, and belonging work exactly the same way. To move from loneliness to belonging, I have to make the three-pronged connection to the belonging power source, which is other people, friends. Those three prongs that allow me to fully connect to others are positive affect, consistent unplanned interactions, and some level of shared vulnerability. But even if I get connected, I still won't feel a true sense of belonging unless I take advantage of the three-digit programming that those connections make possible. Competence, relatedness, and autonomy. So to recap, number one, you can't have a deep sense of belonging if competence, relatedness, and autonomy are removed from community. Number two, you can't have community without first connecting to other people. And number three, you won't ever be able to fully connect to other people without the three-pronged structure of positive affect, consistent unplanned interactions, and some level of shared vulnerability. Now, in my next episode of this podcast, I'd like to share some tips that both experts and the Bible say can help in achieving that three-pronged connection with others. For now, remember, a better mind always leads to a better life.